The last videos in this series have all talked about the discrete time Fourier series. We now turn our attention to the discrete time Fourier transform. This is the transform that we use for non-periodic discrete time signals. What we're going to see is that we now need basically a whole continuum of frequencies. For the DTFS, since we were dealing with periodic signals, we only needed the fundamental frequency and two times the fundamental frequency, three times the fundamental three frequency, etc. Just the fundamental frequency and what we called the harmonics of the fundamental frequency. Now when we write down x ok, we're actually going to write it as a weighted integral. So we're actually going to need to integrate up a contribution from every frequency in order to form x ok now. So a little bit more complicated but the DTFT is what we'll be able to use to write x, x of k conceptually still in a very similar manner. It's still a weighted summation of complex exponentials. So let's go ahead and derive that equation. And our strategy here is going to be to use what we know about the DTFS. So first of all, we're talking about working with non-periodic discrete time signals. So here's just a little cartoon where I sketched a non-periodic signal x of k. And then what I want to do is I want to come up with an equation that describes the frequency domain content of this signal. Right now we don't know how to do that because all we know how to deal with is periodic signals. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to create a new periodic signal and I'm going to call it x sub n naught of k. And I'm going to create it from my starting signal by taking kind of the interesting content of the signal and then repeating it up and down the time axis in increments of n naught. Obviously, this signal right now is not equal to the signal I started with. So I've kind of kind of gone down a route that seems to not make sense. However, with this signal right here, I have a periodic signal and I know how to write down the discrete time Fourier series. So we're going to go ahead and do that. And then what I can do is once I've written down that frequency domain representation, I can take the limit as n naught gets big. And then these gaps in between here will get very, very large. And in the limit as n naught gets big, this periodic signal will eventually equal the signal that I started with. So that's going to be kind of our strategy. Write down the frequency domain representation for this signal since we know how to, and then let n naught get large, and whatever comes out we're going to call the frequency domain representation of this non-periodic signal x of k. So that's our strategy. All right, let's go ahead and get to it. Since x sub n naught is periodic, we know how to write down the DTFS, right? Here is the DTFS equation we've used and derived in the last videos. It's a weighted summation of n naught things where we have our DTFS weights multiplying exponentials that are multiples of the fundamental frequency omega naught. We also have a nice equation for the DTFS coefficients. We know how to write those like this. The DTFS coefficients we can write down as weighting x times e to the minus jr omega naught. And we do a sum over a total of n naught things. Here I wrote it as a sum from minus n to n because once you get past capital N, you get to zeros anyway, right? You also might be wondering, hey, we're talking about the periodic signal x of n naught here, and you wrote down x of k. Well, remember, in that middle time interval from minus n to n, x of n naught and x of k are exactly the exact same signal. So I can put either x of k here or x of n naught on that middle interval. Also, since x of k is 0 outside of minus n to n, I don't have to stop right here. I can go from minus infinity to infinity because all I'm doing here in this summation is bringing in more zeros, right? x of k actually turns off after some values. So if I keep summing, I'm not changing anything. Or if I keep summing for negative time, I'm not changing anything either. So I claim that the coefficients right here, I can write as this equation right here. And that's using what we know about the DTFS. All right, here's now where we kind of just introduce something interesting. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call this frequency function capital X of omega. You'll see why here in just a minute. Eventually, this is going to be our definition of the DTFT. If you compare this equation right here to the equation we had on the previous chart for the DTFS coefficients, this equation right here looks almost identical to what we had. The only difference is, is I don't have a 1 over n naught out front, and the only other difference is up here in the argument of the exponential. 
Previously in the exponential argument, I had r omega naught, and here I just have omega. What that means is that this function, x of omega, and my drs are related in a very simple way. If I just multiply my function by 1 over n naught and evaluate this function at r omega naught, it turns out that the DTFS coefficients and this new frequency function x of omega that I've introduced are related by that circled equation right there. And you'll see why that's a kind of an interesting or good thing to do here in just a moment. What that means is that my DTFS representation that I had on the previous slide, instead of writing in terms of dr, let's rewrite it in terms of this frequency function. So I substitute that in. I still have a very looking summation, but now instead of drs, I have x of r omega naught. All right, so that's how we got to that equation. And then what did I do to go from here to here? I brought the n naught inside of the summation. And then we know um, how n naught is related to omega naught, right? n naught is equal to 2 pi over omega naught, which means 1 over n naught is equal to omega naught over 2 pi. So I just did that substitution, kind of got rid of the n naughts in replace of the omega naughts. All right, so that's where we're at. So, so far, this is what we have here for the DTFS representation of our signal x of n naught. And eventually, I'm going to let n naught get really, really big, and we'll see what happens over here. In fact, let's go ahead and do that. Let's let n naught get large. We know that as n naught gets large, that in the limit, this periodic discrete time signal turns into the signal that I wanted to analyze in the very beginning. Also, think about the relationship between n naught and omega naught. Remember, n naught is 2 pi over omega naught. So if n naught is getting very large, that means that omega naught must be getting very small. So these two limits right here are completely equivalent because n naught and omega naught are related in a linear fashion to each other. So instead of thinking about n naught getting large, I can equivalently think about omega naught getting small. And you'll see why that's kind of a, a good thing to do here in just a minute. So going back to the previous chart, if I just rearrange that summation a little bit and take the limit as omega naught gets very small, I'm actually taking the limit of this quantity right here. So you can see all I did was kind of bring in the omega naught and 2 pi and kind of brought out the exponential. Just a little bit of an algebraic rearrangement, nothing too profound there. Also, typically when you're doing calculus and you have quantities in the limit approaching zero, you often use kind of delta notation, right? Hey, these delta quantities are very small and the limit um, as delta goes to zero. So just as a notational aid, instead of writing omega naughts, Let's replace these omega naughts with delta omegas. So that's a pure notational substitution. We don't have to do that, but I think you'll see why we want to do that here to make things more clear on the following slide. So let's go ahead and replace all the omega naughts with delta omegas and still let them get very small. I'm still taking the limit as they get small. Here's what I end up with. And then just one final small little algebraic rearrangement. I'll go ahead and bring the two pi out front to get that out there. And then here's what I'm left with inside of the summation. And what's going on in there is very important. Look what I'm doing. I have this function that I am querying at increments of delta omega naught, right? I'm, there's r times delta omega naught, and I'm summing over r. So I'm querying this function at increments of delta omega. How many times am I querying this? Well, I'm querying it at an infinite number of points because n naught's getting big omega naught's getting small. So I'm sampling this function in very, very fine increments of delta omega, and delta omega is getting smaller and smaller. Then look what I'm doing. I'm taking that function, I'm sampling at those increments, and I'm multiplying by kind of the spacing that I'm querying it at. In the limit, as delta goes to zero, this right here is what we call a Riemann sum, right? That's what we all agreed a Riemann sum was query a continuous function at inc increments, let those increments get smaller and smaller, and then multiply by the width of that increment and add up all those little strips to get the area. That's what we've agreed is an integral. So actually when I'm all said and done here taking this limit, I've been able to write x of k as a weighted integral where my weights are this function x of omega and each one of these weights is weighting a complex exponential at the frequency omega. 
So it still looks very much the same way. I'm adding up a whole bunch of complex exponentials of different frequencies. Just now the weights aren't these discrete valued weights at specific frequencies. There's a whole continuum of values. I need x of omega at every value omega to contribute to this integral. Also, one thing that's interesting to pay attention to here, in the limit as omega naught gets small, as I'm adding up all of these pieces, it turns out that the number of pieces n naught that I'm adding up times delta omega remains constant. So I'm always adding up more and more points, but kind of the range of points I'm adding up is always 2 pi. That's why the integral limits here collapsed to 2 pi. And that kind of makes sense too, because what we'll see here is that this function is a 2 pi periodic function. So to get the DTFT representation, I only need to integrate over one period of this periodic um, frequency domain function. All right, so we kind of got to the punchline. We've been able to write x of k as a weighted combination of complex exponentials yet again. It turns out that this equation right here is very important, as well as what we defined previously for x of omega. So let's go ahead and go back now and define what those quantities are. It turns out that x of omega is what we call the DTFT of the discrete time signal x of k. This equation right here is what we use to find the frequency domain representation of x of k. Notice that we're now summing over an infinite number of values in the time domain to result in a continuous function x of omega. So capital omega is a continuous valued variable. For whatever reason, students mix that up a lot and they think that omega is discrete, but it's not. It's a continuous valued variable, and this is a continuous function that we plot in the frequency domain. So that's the discrete time Fourier transform. Going the other way, this is what we would call the inverse discrete time Fourier transform. It lets me go from the frequency domain, perform an operation, and then get back to the time domain. So this is also often called the Fourier integral representation of the signal. I usually think of it as the inverse discrete time Fourier transform. A few other comments. These are very similar to the comments we made for the DTFS. We say that x of k and x of omega are a DTFT pair, and we often use this kind of double arrow notation to indicate if you give me x of k, I can get x of omega, or if you give me x of omega, I can get back x of k. If you know one, you can compute the other perfectly and go back and forth as you would like. Another word that we use a lot is we call this the frequency domain representation of the signal because it tells me the same information as I had before. X of omega tells me how much of the frequency omega is present in the signal. In general, this is a complex quantity, so the magnitude of X of omega tells me the amplitude of the frequency at omega, and the phase of X of omega tells me the phase of the frequency at omega. One thing you do have to watch out here in the DTFT, though, is since we're performing this infinite sum from k equals minus infinity to infinity, that's not necessarily always going to converge. Sometimes things blow up when you try to plug into the DTFT. So let's make a few comments on that. In undergraduate classes, you don't worry about this too much. You just usually check to make sure it does or doesn't converge, and you don't worry about the types of convergence too much. And we're going to do the same thing here, but it's at least good to mention these concepts so you're aware of it going forward. So the easy case to check for is if you have a discrete time signal x of k that is finite in length and the values that it takes on are finite as well, then you're definitely going to converge because you're just summing up a finite number of finite things. So that's the easy case if x of k itself is kind of a short signal or a finite duration signal. Where things get more interesting is what happens when you have an x of k that exists for all time, right? Maybe that turns on at time zero and goes to the right for forever, or maybe it's on from minus infinity to infinity. Well, in that case, there are two things that you can check. The first thing is you can perform this operation. You can take the magnitude or the absolute value of x of k and add up that time domain signal for all time. If you end up getting a number that is less than infinity, then we call that something special. We say that x of k is absolutely summable. So if I can take the absolute value over all time, add up all those values over all time, and get out some number less than infinity, then I am an absolutely summable signal. When you're an absolutely summable signal, that implies a certain type of convergence 
namely it converges uniformly. So absolutely some of those signals in the time domain have uniformly convergent DTFTs. What does uniformly convergent mean exactly? Let's not get into that right now. Just be aware of that word. It is a, an important word that you'll probably encounter later on in grad school. Similarly, I can perform another very similar operation. Instead of taking the magnitude and adding up, take the magnitude, square it, and add up. So if that is also a number less than infinity, so kind of the sum over all time of the magnitude squareds is less than infinity, that implies another type of convergence. In this case, we say that the DTFT is convergent in a mean square sense. Again, what does that mean exactly? We should probably go to find that rigorously. We're not going to do that right now. Just be aware that there is this concept of mean square convergence associated with um, things in the limit converging to values. So that's it for now. Just be aware that short signals, easy to deal with. If you have infinitely long signals, you can perform these two operations and then know that these types of convergence do exist and know that your DTFT does converge. All right, just uh, one more final comment before we end this video. As I noted before, in general, x of omega is complex valued. So again, we have to find a way to plot this two-dimensional quantity. And we take the exact same approach that we took for the DTFS. We'll usually plot the amplitude as a function of frequency, and we call that the amplitude spectrum. Or we'll plot the angle as a function of frequency, and we call that the phase spectrum of the signal. When we plot these, they're both uh, plots of the continuous variable omega. And it turns out, like I said before, that both of these are going to be periodic with period 2 pi. So anytime you end up plotting either the amplitude spectrum or the phase spectrum, often what we do is we only plot it from minus pi to pi, which is what we call the fundamental frequency region. And we know that outside of that 2 pi interval, what you've plotted just repeats over and over and over again. That's typically what you do. All right, so that's it on the DTFT. We've actually derived the um, discrete time Fourier transform representation of a non-periodic signal in this video. We've talked a lot about the theory and you know a lot of these things about how to plot things, convergence of things, um, lots of theory and the equations are all now established. In the next videos, what we're going to do now is work a series of different examples. So I'll actually give you a discrete time signal x of k and then we'll compute the DTFT for a variety of examples. Thanks for watching.